Hello. My father was born 100 years ago today, 16th of May, 1920. I thought I would tell you a little bit about him today being a special day, the 100th birthday. Unfortunately, my father passed away about seven years ago when I was working in the Eunuch Indio um, University and he died just before the Christmas and I had to go back for the funeral. Um, it's terrible to lose somebody. It's extra terrible to lose them just before Christmas because it's a time when you want to, to celebrate. So somehow, while everything was going on, after the funeral, I decided that we needed to um, change the, the mood a little bit in our house. So I wrote you a little bit about my father. Um, I don't normally talk about him. I know you all, most of my people know about my mum, my red-headed mum. So this is to tell you everything about my father. Uh, let's go. So somehow decided we needed to celebrate Christmas. My mother was now my priority and I wanted her to be happy. So I invited all my parents, best friends to a party four days before Christmas. I filled the house with food, drink and music and everyone bought flowers and chocolates for my mum and she had a great night. To be perfectly honest, 20 minutes before the first person arrived, my mum started to cry and I consoled her. I had been expecting it, and I was happy that it happened when we were alone before the people arrived. Then I went away, I went to my room, I had my little cry, and it got it out of our system, and then we were able to enjoy our night and see my mum's friends before Christmas. Everybody was extremely supportive, and they smiled all night, which was the most important thing. These parties are now traditional for my mum and we've had to add some people to the invitation list because all my parents' friends are quite old and some of them started to disappear for obvious reasons. So I needed to boost the numbers. We also have a summer party in the garden now for the same group of friends and at nearly 96 now, my mum can still party with a whiskey until midnight and sometimes beyond. I run around serving food and drinks with my friend Pat. You've seen pictures of my friend Pat. She's my waitress. She always comes to stay and helps me prepare the food and run around serving people their drinks. And I usually get an hour to sit down and have a drink with close friends after most people have gone home. The house rule is that we have to clean everything before we go to bed. I still do it now. Never, never go to bed drunk with your house in a mess. Always clean your house before you go to bed. During the time since my father died, I wasn't really able to look at his photos on the wall. And there are many of them around my house in England. I just, I've just learned to walk past them without looking at them. I did feel his presence in the house for a few years and it didn't scare me in any way. No, I'm not saying his ghost was in the house, but the f house felt safe and normal, as though he was still there taking care of us. Thankfully, he didn't die in the house, so we don't have any horrible memories to haunt us in that respect. When I returned to Colombia after the Christmas, I started to have these intermediate and advanced classes, and I needed to write material, a lot of material, I found it very easy to write about my mum, but I still couldn't write anything about my father. I tried to block his image from my mind every time his name was mentioned. Obviously, I had psychological problems because I was able to mention him in stories which were related to my mother, but I couldn't talk about him in relation to me. When I started today, my plan was to talk about him and his life. But I've only really talked about me so far. So let's try to do this. I want to tell you about my dad. And for the first time, I will tell you that his name was Arthur. 
I used to call him Arthur because we did a lot of things together from when I was around 11 years old. We were in an entertainment group called the Revelers. Um, we did shows for old people and hospitals in our area. Everyone else called him Arthur, and if I was looking for him, I would have to ask if anyone had seen Arthur, because not everyone in the world knew that we were related. Arthur was born in Scotland, so I'm half Scottish. And he retained his Scottish accent for all of his life. Yes, this does mean that I'm half Scottish, which is very useful during World Cup football tournaments when you don't want to be English anymore. He was born in 1920, May the 16th, just one year after the Royal Air Force was formed. And when he was 16, he joined the RAF as an apprentice engineer. My mother always tells us that he was the top trainee in the year. My father was a perfectionist. I can believe that he was like that, even when he was so young. So he's the complete opposite of me. The complete opposite. I am not a perfectionist, as you know. When he was only 19, the Second World War started in 1939. And he was immediately sent into action. His job was to service and maintain the Royal Air Force airplanes and make sure as many as possible were safe and ready to fly. He was a flight sergeant, which is like a captain. And he had a team of men, who were boys, who were responsible for repairing the hundreds of aircraft. To be able to fix these planes, my father had to know everything about every one of them. After his death, I found certificates which showed that he was capable of fixing five different models of airplane. Five different ones. He knew every nut and bolt and screw, everything about them. During the war, things became more complicated and they needed to, re to repair the airplanes actually in France so that they would be closer to Germany. France was occupied by German troops and this was really very dangerous territory. So Arthur joined a troop of commandos and was trained in covert operations. His work involved infiltrating French territory and making temporary airfields for the planes to use when they needed repairs. They had to work on the planes and send them up again as quickly as possible. My father wrote a book about his life in this period and one of his anecdotes is that one day a British plane landed for repairs in his airfield and his own brother, my uncle Les, who unfortunately just died last year, climbed out of the cockpit. Both of them were on secret missions and neither knew that the other one was stationed where the other one was stationed during the war. So it was a great surprise for both of them. In later life, their paths crossed again when my uncle Les was responsible for hiring engineers at British Airways and he found a place for Arthur at London Airport. He stayed there for 35 years. So, back to France. Every three months, each person in the RF, RAF was given two weeks leave. Leave is uh, free time back to the, U to the United Kingdom. But the RAF only took them to a flying base in the south of England. It was expensive and took a lot of time for my father to travel to Scotland. So he usually stayed on the base each time. There were a lot of parties and dances for the people on the base. And one day, one of my father's crew asked him if he was going to the dance. He jokingly replied he would only go if they could find him a tall redhead as a date for him to go with. He thought he was really safe asking for something so unusual. This man that he told went running off to the cafeteria where my mum was working, a tall redhead, and said, Hey, would you like to go to a dance with my flight sergeant tonight? 
He will only go if he has a date with a tall redhead. And this is where the destiny of my life and my brothers and all the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and our relationship could have changed. In that tiny moment of time, while she made the decision, she said, yes. And the man went running back to tell a very, very surprised Arthur, because he was not expecting that. But he's a man of his word. We do have that in common. I am a man of my word. Now, when my mother first saw Arthur, she was disappointed. She didn't like short men, and she <laughs> hated Scottish men. So he had to work really very hard to win her heart. My father was charming with women, very charming, very respectful, but also very cheeky, and he always made naughty jokes. My mum liked boys, and she welcomed this attention and was able to ignore her prejudices, short and Scottish. They had a great night at the dance, and they agreed to meet for a second date. My mum waited on the corner for him very late one night, and eventually my father arrived on a bicycle, very, very late, drunk, absolutely as drunk as a skunk, and he fell on the floor laughing at her feet. That was their second date. Three months later, three months later, he returned to the Air Force base and they continued their romance with my mother escaping from her quarters through a small window in the kitchen late at night. She tells me these things now. One night they were talking and Arthur told her that if they were married, he could stay for three weeks instead of two weeks. So they decided to get married the next week. In just seven days, during a war, they organised a white wedding in a church with family and friends, and they had a seven-day honeymoon in Scotland. That moment of madness lasted nearly 70 years. After the war, lots of servicemen continued to work overseas, helping to keep the peace. My mother and father spent time in Egypt and they were able to save money and come back with enough money for a deposit to buy a house in the south of England. It was a basic house with no electricity, but it was in a beautiful area surrounded by woods and fields, very similar to Colombia, without the snakes and spiders. They stayed in a place called Crowborough, for many years and that is where my sister and eldest brother were raised. By coincidence I went to live in that same town many many years later. During those years in Crowborough my father had many different jobs from insurance agent to car mechanic and life was not easy after the war for ex-servicemen. People didn't have much money, so there were very few jobs. Ironically, Germany recovered from the war much faster because they had more manufacturing abilities, learnt during the war, and they became the strongest country economically. In Europe, Germany was ahead of everyone in the ten years after the war. Arthur was a man with great talent but with nowhere to use it. This is the moment where his brother Les saved the day with that job in London Airport. Remember I told you he got him a job? The family moved nearer to London Airport and very quickly Arthur was asked to set up a brand new department in the airport called a Non-Destructive Testing Unit, NDT. Many airplanes were crashing and metal fatigue was blamed for many failures. Metal fatigue is when you get cracks from metal moving. 
by using x-rays, he was able to inside, see inside the metal components and see if there were any cracks. His job was to invent the techniques and decide which parts to test on the airplane and when and how often to test them. When a plane crashed, he had to find out why and accumulate as much information as possible. This was a new technology and airlines were worried about their safety records. They needed their planes to be much, much, much safer. Arthur was meticulous in everything that he did and he worked long hours trying to perfect his processes and tests. He became a world expert in NDT, non-destructive testing. As a young boy, I remember him traveling around the world, teaching other engineers about NDT. All of us fly more safely now, thanks to the work of a pioneer in a technology called NDT. His name was Arthur Bond, my dad. A hundred years ago today, he was born. Happy birthday, Arthur. Thank you for listening. Bye.